Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, four very uh, different views uh, to talk about one very large picture. Um, now we'll open up for questions, so if you just put your hand up, uh, pass the mic to Jillian and she'll bring it over to you. I guess I, I could maybe start there. And I haven't found those studies in, in particular, but um, the use of your energy is, uh, how you use it is, is dependent a lot on cost. And I think Jeffrey spoke about it a little bit about when you use electricity for heat, it's much more expensive than, say, natural gas for heat. And so I think those conversion options are, it's one way to address it. But I think with the fuels we're talking about, when we're talking about, um, uh, you know, for example, uh, the, the oil sands, the, the fossil fuels, the, the market is kind of dictating that the fuels in those, uh, in those, in that format, in the liquid fuel, is a much higher demand and, and seems to be a more economical for the market. So rather than converting it to energy, the market really isn't there, or converting to electricity, the market isn't really there for that. But Jeff, I don't know if you if you know uh, more about kind of the cost of electricity versus natural gas for heat? Uh, no. <laughs> no, um, in terms of, of the, uh, the electrons versus molecules argument, I don't have any study that I, I can draw from. Typically we're a hydro-centric province and um, natural gas is one of those uh, embedded uh, systems that came in a long time ago that we still great, gain great benefit from. Well, it still also depends on the economic costs and the investment required to uh, uh, have these technologies. Uh, and usually that is uh, left to the marketplace to <laughs> sort of determine. Somebody finds a less costly alternative and usually the utilities and the uh, energy suppliers uh, will, um, and other energy suppliers will uh, try to you know, get into it, but uh, it often, you know, conceptually, it may be, you know, maybe that. So, if you were to sort of be more specific in terms of your question, I would find it easier or to. Well, uh, yeah, but that's based on talking about environmental. Surely they would probably be able to do that, and they probably do a lot of that. Who really, once it leaves the, t the area of the oil sands, nobody's going to uh, sort of you know, try to <laughs> insert some medical device to check out <laughs> what the, uh, uh, you know, what the heritage of that, uh, um, you know, that energy source is. I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you for the comment because I think when we cost these things, we tend to look very cast a very narrow net, and you have to look at both the cost of the damage done to the environment and the cost done to the people who are directly affected by it. Whether it's southern farmers or whether it's northern indigenous communities, uh, those impacts have to be costed in if you're going to do any kind of fair costing and any kind of fair comparison. And uh, Hydro did, uh, uh, you know, the communities voted on the Wasquatam Agreement. I have one little story that I have to tell you about that. Uh, Nisichwasik had about 5,000 band members. About 1,000 of them were in a sub-band called South Indian Lake. South Indian Lake had been applying for 20 years to be a separate band because it felt its grievances with Hydro and its situation was, was entirely you know, specific. It was going to be a very close vote, and people knew that the thousand votes in South Indian Lake were all going to go against the Wasquatam Agreement. After applying to be a separate First Nation or band for 20 years, um, 
Four months before the vote was held, they were suddenly given separate band status, which meant that they were no longer voting on the Wisconsin Agreement. And I'm told that officials for the Department of Indian Affairs were working on December 23rd to get the paperwork done, so the announcement could be made in January that they were a separate band, and I think the vote was held uh, in the late spring or early summer. So, um, you know, uh, there are questions to be asked. And I, sh I would also say that the, the voting standard for the subsequent kiosk agreement was much uh, less democratic. So there's some questions there. The question of, of hydro is a really interesting one, as, as is nuclear power. In the United States, large-scale hydro is not considered renewable power. In, in Canada, it typically is. And uh, it's, it's an ongoing debate. And part of uh, what Canadian hydro companies are doing, and Manitoba Hydro is doing, is for their, for their interest is seeking to get, get large-scale hydro considered a renewable power. And if you think about it, why would it not be considered a renewable uh, power in the United States? It's because of those social impacts. You look at, for anybody who's toured Hoover Dam, for instance, uh, you can see these uh, huge legacy issues. Uh, nuclear power is the same sort of thing. It, there's, so if you were to, to, to sort of rank power that, to move away from, and, and keeping in mind my perspective is, is an environmental and emissions perspective, and there are very, very substantial social license issues in both forms of power. We're at the end of the coal era now. I think the next, the next one that we're going to be going after probably is oil and gas. We've had talks about emissions regulations in the oil sector, in particular for the emissions intensive oil sands, natural gas being next. But then we get to this question, and you're very right, is what, where do we stop and what do we consider renewable power and what don't we? And I think it's over the next 50 years that we're going to be really looking at oil and gas because we're going to run out, particularly oil first. But then we get into these other questions. And uh, I mean, ideally, uh, a lot of people say solar power is the ideal power because we've got the sun and it's right there and it's, it's coming down to us. And if we can harness that power, it's the, it, you know, it's the most uh, stable power source. But there are, uh, so hydro and, and nuclear are somewhere between solar power and where we are now. I couldn't venture that time frame, but you're absolutely right with the with the, the environmental and social impacts of those two sources. Most of these uh, alternatives that are being discussed here are very much an uh, element of, uh, you know, determined by a kind of comparative economic valuation. And uh, the economic valuation is uh, uh, much more complicated because uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of incomplete information attached to many of these technological alternatives. Yeah, we could say this, we could say that, but when you need to, uh, uh, you know, when you're forecasting uh, that there's, the population's going to grow by 100,000 in the next 10 years, and you want to meet the demand for that, uh, you know, you, you have to kind of look at what you, feed, you check out various feasible alternatives and so on, but uh, and there will be competing interests trying to sell you. It's like uh, buying your next car and trying to decide, well, am I going to buy this model or that model? Will it be small or big or, or what's going to happen or, or almost anything? So you, uh, these kinds of decisions are made within a particular social context, within a particular environment and so on. And so all of these uh, things depend also, secondly, on uh, investment, uh, 
you know, being in many cases 50, uh, you know, really, uh, uh, like, why would why would they close the Hoover, Hoover Dam now when it produces electricity and may produce it for another 50 years? Uh, it's a great tourist attraction, and it does a whole bunch of other has another a lot of economic ongoing benefits. It would be crazy to close the Hoover Dam, uh, okay? And it's gonna so so that's what some of these things boil down to, and uh, you know we're living in a certain kind of a in this kind of economic environment where that's the way people make their decisions. Decisions based on advertising, based on uh, promotion, based on tourism promotion, government promotion, and other kinds of things. So. Well, I'd say, you know, uh, also uh, the words river rehabilitation aren't used very much in Manitoba, so that's a word that we should put into our lexicon and start thinking about. Are we even setting aside funds so that when we get to decommissioning dams, we don't just decommission them, but we do a proper job and look at river rehabilitation. We do studies that look at what the river's like before the dam, and we think about what the, the rivers look like after the dam. If we were talking now, we might wonder whether the Hoover Dam should be built, if that question were being asked today. We're not asking that about the Kiosk Dam, and barely seem to be asking that about the Conewapa Dam. So you know, we're still go, 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 build, 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 flood, flood, flood. And bear in mind, uh, many of the, the, the dams, the biggest dams in the world, are built in gorges. So they're filling up a canyon. Uh, in northern Manitoba, we don't have a lot of canyons, so we're, we're flooding a huge territory of land and releasing ground, ground level mercury into the water, which creates a whole other cycle of you know, poisoning the fish and making life much harder for local people to have any kind of traditional subsistence based economy. So there are issues around that that I think we need to be talking about as well. Just a point of clarification. Um, <clears throat> The, the Westbottom Dam has a reservoir that's on average about the size of a, a shopping mall parking lot. It's much smaller than, than, uh, than some of the big scale dams that were built before. Um, that was uh, negotiated and decided upon with the community in questions. And um, the, the idea of uh, new generation is, is, is different like, in, in a way because we have, we have the benefit of hindsight now. So we're not building Kanawapa. Um, there was an announcement um, last fall that um, the Public Utilities Board, through the NPEC process, um, said that that was not on the table. Kiosk is uh, still being designed and considered, as is some, uh, some transmission. Um, but those processes, that NPEC process was uh, fairly substantial in terms of time and, and consultation. I think, Peter, you're familiar with that as well. And, and, uh, it, are things always perfect? No, but um, processes like NFAT, processes like uh, Crown Aboriginal consultations, these are things that are working to, uh, to, to avoid some of the errors that may have been made in the past and, and, and provide a voice to people who wouldn't have had a voice before. And that includes uh, environmentalists in the south of, uh, of Manitoba, just as it does uh, Aboriginal communities in the north.